Hey, I'm Mark Brown, and this is Game Makers Toolkit. I've done a bunch of videos on my channel about platformer level design, but it has almost always been through the lens of Nintendo games, which have a pretty reliable formula at this point. Each stage introduces a new gameplay mechanic, and that idea is explored through a series of escalating challenges. And then the mechanic is thrown away, never to be seen again. And that's certainly one way to do it, but it's not the only approach. So let's take a look at a platformer that does things quite differently. Ubisoft's Rayman Legends. So this game has plenty of unique ideas, but the game's standout mechanics aren't ditched as soon as they're developed. Instead, they're often carried through an entire world's worth of levels. In World 2, Toad Story, practically every level is about updrafts that you can fly in. And in World 3, Fiesta de los Muertos, a bunch of the levels are about digging through big chunks of cake. But if you ask me, the best example is from World 4. 20,000 Lums Under the Sea. This world is a sneaky spy thriller with James Bond-style music and stealthy gameplay that's maybe closer to Splinter Cell than Rayman. The main mechanic for this world is the Sentry, which is a sort of mechanized security system that casts a green light or red if Rayman gets too close, and if Rayman stays in the red light for too long, he'll be zapped. So it's all about sneaking past the sentry at the right moment. There are ones that flicker on and off, and ones that move, so you need to hide behind bits of the level that cut off the sentry's light. They appear in almost every stage in this world, but each level has a unique twist on the idea. They're introduced in level 1, the mysterious inflatable island, where you avoid the lights by swimming past them. Then, in stage two, the deadly lights, we use this tiny green guy called Murphy to press buttons and pop up barriers to obstruct the sentry's lights. This makes more sense if you're playing on a console like the Wii U, where you can physically poke, grab, and move stuff with the touchscreen. It's a bit janky on the other consoles where you just press a button. Anyway, stage three, the Mansion of the Deep, is different again. The level starts with no sentries, but then you hit a power button and must go back through the same rooms, but now thinking about stealth. Level 4, Infiltration Station, brings back Murphy, but now you have full control over the level as you move bits of the stage to create cover and even move the sentries themselves. And then in level 5, Elevator Ambush, the sentries are still present, but the stealth gameplay takes a bit of a backseat to a more action-packed fistfight against these new frogmen enemies. Because obviously, there's more to this world than just one mechanic. Level 1 also introduces us to spiky naval mines and frogmen who fire electrical blasts. Level 3 adds laser tripwires, giant crushing pipes, and two extra underwater creatures, jellyfish and these freaky worm things. And level 5 adds another enemy type, plus weird shark guys who throw objects across the room, and missiles, which were briefly seen in the boss fight from Toad Story. What's clever is that most of these mechanics are introduced on their own, but then go on to appear in tandem with the sentries. Enemies pop up in areas guarded by the sentries, the nightmare worms create fast-moving and oddly-shaped cover, and so on. And then, after five stages of build-up, all of these ideas come together in the sixth stage, There's Always a Bigger Fish, which is a manic, fast-paced chase sequence that uses almost every mechanic we've seen so far. There are naval mines, sentries, missiles, frogmen, shark dudes, and laser tripwires. And yet, it's totally doable, simply because the game has spent a lot of time carefully building up this vocabulary of different mechanics. The player has learned what these things look like, what they do, and how to deal with them, even at great speed. Because if you don't do the necessary prep work, the player won't have the skills to deal with these mechanics when put under pressure. And as an example of this happening, you need look no further than Rayman Legends itself. The game's got these brilliant musical stages at the end of each world, but for whatever reason, they often have slightly different mechanics to the rest of the levels. Mechanics which haven't always been fully established. So in Mariachi Madness, you'll be running through the level at breakneck speed and suddenly see a creature that you've never seen before, and need to figure out what that is and what you need to do with it in a split second, and yeah, I didn't react quickly enough, and that didn't feel good. So introducing mechanics early isn't just responsible level design, but it also gives players an opportunity to feel a sense of flow and mastery that isn't halted by trial and error deaths. 
That stage in 20,000 Lums feels amazing because you're going really fast and nailing all of these challenges, but that's only possible because you're familiar with everything the level has to throw at you. That level is then followed by a boss fight, and then a swim back to the surface for the musical number, taking you full circle to the island you started on in level 1. Now, not every world is like this in Rayman Legends. Some worlds are linked by a theme, like World 1's castle, rather than a game mechanic. And there are plenty of one-off ideas, like a level about spreading guacamole and a twisting labyrinth stage that are thrown away at the end of the level, just like a Mario mechanic. But 20,000 Lums demonstrate some real benefits to keeping a mechanic around for longer than just one level. It means that idea can be explored exhaustively, the sentries are seen in endless variations and they slowly ramp up in difficulty. They start to move more quickly, the cover gets smaller, they appear in pairs or mix with other mechanics, and instead of just waiting for an opportunity to proceed, you have to move in lockstep with the cover to stay hidden. You'll see even more variants in the world's secret rooms, and if you want to go for bonus pickups like coins and kidnapped teensies, you'll have to put yourself at risk and deal with even more challenging sentries. Keeping a mechanic around also means it can appear in more difficult scenarios, and the player will be able to deal with it in masterful fashion. In Mario, you've got to wait until the end game bonus stages to ever face a mechanic in a more tricky setup. A mechanic can also act as a thread to create a wider narrative progression for the world. The sentries are prominent at the start of 20,000 Lums Under the Sea, where Rayman is using stealth to get around, but they disappear towards the end as, in classic spy movie fashion, all hell breaks loose for the action-packed finale. And finally, and this one might be handy for any indie developers watching, it's also surely a tad more economical to keep an idea around for more than one level than developing 100 different game mechanics. We can't all be Nintendo, can we? Hey, thanks for watching. I also want to say thanks to Rayman level designer Chris McEntee, who chatted to me about the creation of this world. I asked him whether the mechanic informed the theme, or if the theme led to the mechanic, and he told me that it was kind of a mix of the two. The gameplay team was prototyping the sentry, and the art team did some Jules Verne-style underwater artwork, and these came together for a world about sneaking through an underwater base. Apparently there was a real back and forth of art and gameplay inspiring each other throughout the creation of Rayman Legends. Chris is now working on the Ori and the Blind Forest sequel, meaning I'm even more excited about that game.